In this lecture video, I'm going to discuss landing gear systems, landing gears, wheels, tires, brakes, and shock absorbers that are found on transport category aircraft. Just kind of the basics, landing gear design for transport aircraft. Regulatory is under 14 CFR Part 25, as is all designed for transport aircraft, and it's in chapters or sections 721 to 737. The landing gear has several purposes it needs to uh, fulfill on a transport carrier aircraft, including shock absorption, particularly on landing, but also a certain amount during taxi. Uh, retraction systems to be able to move up out of the way while the airplane's flying to reduce drag. The wheels and tires that uh, go with it, and then the brakes and braking systems, uh, including things like auto braking and anti-skid. And in some cases, aircraft even operate on skis, although on transport aircraft, that's rarely seen nowadays. Design requirements, just some basic information on it. The landing gear is designed for practicality. The weight is kept to a minimum as much as possible while still being able to support the aircraft and absorb the shock of landing. It also needs to withstand things like side loads in the event of landing with a crosswind. Uh, in order to help with takeoff and getting up to speed, minimizing rolling friction is very important. It does a certain amount of smoothing bumps during taxi, but those of you that have uh, been in transport aircrafts to some degree or any degree may notice that they ride pretty rough on the ground. And that's because they're not really designed for comfort uh, during taxi, uh, but rather the, those shock absorption has to be fairly stiff in order to absorb that energy of planes weighing anywhere from 50,000 to close to a million pounds uh, landing during the landing process. They have provisions for steering. We need to maximize traction, uh, especially in poor weather conditions like snow and ice. Uh, minimizing weight, and again, weight is leads to inefficiency in the aircraft, so we want to make it strong but lightweight. And then there are protections, spe and specifically for inadvertent retraction uh, while the gear is down, and especially if the airplane's sitting on it, uh, or deployment uh, while the gear is up. The extension and retraction process normally is controlled or is, is performed using hydraulics and mechanical actuation. There are uh, aircraft then, the, the sequencing of it and the process of it can be electrically controlled, mechanically controlled, or even hydraulically controlled. Uh, electrical through things like switches and sensors, mechanical through different linkages, bell cranks and whatnot, and hydraulic through things like sequencing and priority valves. There also have to be provisions, and normal extension is controlled by a normal extension handle, which is shown here kind of near the top of this image. Emergency extension also is required, and this is in the case of not being able to get the gear down or a hydraulic failure, for instance. Uh, and these are often, this is often performed, free fall and gravity is a, is a friend to the engineer in this case, so free fall or gravity helps pull it down. Some gear will have a pneumatic charge, like an accumulator type setup. Some will have things like explosive bolts, which can disconnect hinges and linkages. And then finally, manual, the ability to pump gear down. And if you go up in our 727 under the, in the cockpit, there's three panels under the floor or in the floor to access manual extension pumps to pump down each gear. So they look something like this. So here the, in that, that same center pedestal that was shown earlier, at the bottom of it, there's a red T handle that's circled in yellow. That's a emergency extension handle. Or this other image that's appeared shows kind of how there would be, in some cases, three separate manual extension handles, like what the 727 uses. For normal extension and retraction, there are actuators, and most of them are hydraulic, that are going to move the gear leg doors, things like breakover linkages, uh, different braces, drag braces, and side stays. Uh, and these are made up of various parts. The drag links, uh, which is shown, it's also called a drag strut in this image, uh, those are gonna, gonna absorb the force of the airplane moving forward. The gear is gonna kind of be pulled back by the friction on the ground. Side stays uh, for gear that fold in are gonna be what allows it to fold and to extend uh, but they're going to absorb those side loads and, and it's 
it's shown here on this diagram is called a side strut is another name for it. Locking can often be done using an over center mechanism and we discussed this during lab where the the down locking mechanism and side stays and side struts actually go slightly past uh, straight and, and kind of reverse their bend slightly in order to provide a mechanical lock and that's that over center mechanism. There will be doors integrated with the landing gear. Part of this is to protect gear. An even bigger part of it is to provide aerodynamic smoothness. Once the gear is retracted, those doors close, whether it encloses the entire gear or a partial portion of it, uh, in order to reduce the drag provided that's created from these or that would be created by the openings for the gear wells. Uh, once the gear is up, it needs to be held in that position, and this is done using an uplock assembly. These can be over center linkages. They can also be hook and roller type. Uh, type setups where they lock in where a roller or a pin comes up and locks into a hook. Downlock assemblies, same kind of a thing. Most of those tend to be an over center mechanism, uh, but there are other methods employed depending on the uh, depending on the manufacturer and what the engineers decided, including things like hydraulic locks. Uh, and then in some cases you can have an up and down lock assembly. That's a single item that holds the gear in either direction. And there was one of these demonstrated when you looked at the gear on the 727. The nose on the 727 uses an up and down lock. And it looks something like this. So on the left, the gear is down and locked. The That's the, the in kind of a yellow green. There's the side stay uh, linkage. It's two pieces that are slightly over center held by the pink locking mechanism, which also is over center. Uh, in order for this, the no, the gear, sorry, I, I apologize, this is a drag brace it's showing here because this is a nose gear. Uh, the drag brace is shown in yellow green. In order for that to allow the gear to retract, uh, it has to essentially bend, it flexes, it starts to bend and the locking mechanism bends and then as that continues to travel and the gear makes it to the up position you can see the locking mechanism returns to a over center configuration where it straightens back out but now holding the now holding the drag brace or the drag the drag linkage uh, in a folded position and that would hold the gear up and lock it in place Though the gear can come up, we don't want it to happen on the ground. Uh, we want the airplane. We don't want the airplane to end up on its belly. And so, landing gear are going to have integral safety equipment in order to prevent retraction on the ground. Uh, the biggest part of this is weight on wheels, or known as squat switches or sensors, and they prevent uh, inadvertent gear up selection. In fact, what they do is when weight is on wheels. There is an interlock system that will physically lock the gear handle, the landing gear handle, in the down position. Uh, and it's, it's there to prevent it from being moved into the up position in the first place. The over center linkages and other things like that will also hopefully prevent a gear from being able to fold up uh, while there's weight on it, while it's on the ground. But that's kind of a secondary protection. Uh, the, the gear handles, if you look at this picture, there is a downlock release uh, that can override that. That is in case the plane takes off, it's in the air, and for some reason they can't get the handle to uh, move to the up position because of a failed interlock system. It's also, we would use it in maintenance at times to do certain testing and things like that. But and as part of the safety system, there's warning indications. We saw these. These are configuration warnings uh, where uh, if a gear is selected down, we want to know that it's down and physically locked. And so after a period of time, if it's not physically down and locked, you might get a, a caution or a warning. Uh, this also has to deal with the indicating lights and three green is the common mantra for gear down and locked. And so they, there's an indication to the cockpit. Uh, if you're in the airplane and you're starting to descend uh, and and we want to make sure that the plane doesn't uh, land gear up things like low airspeed or flap deployment for landing configuration uh, or even things like a radio altimeter which gives altitude readings close to the ground uh, those can trigger a 
uh, it can trigger a configuration warning system where if the gear is still up and throttles have been pulled back, airspeed is low, flaps are in the down position, uh, and radio or and or radio altimeter senses that the aircraft is low, it'll trigger a warning to prevent a gear up landing. There's a few videos here of different gear up landings. Most of these these were intentional or gear up landings due to a malfunction rather than uh, accidental, but uh, the result is the same. From maintenance, it's going to require some repairs. The side of this that actuates or that runs that and, and gives information to the airplane that lets it know the gear position uh, includes things like micro switches or proximity switches or sensors. And these can be in many different locations on the gear to give status indication to the aircraft. Uh, I'll point out here, this picture is a uh, a proximity switch or a proximity sensor. There's no physical contact. What you have is an inductive sensor there and that there's a metal target in front of it and that target would move in front of it or away from it depending on its position. So they don't have it's there are some gear that do use micro switches, although those being physical switches, they tend not to be as reliable, whereas proximity switches and sensors are very reliable because there's no moving parts. But these can be placed on things like up locks, down locks, various linkages, actuators. They can be on the doors themselves. Um, in terms of like linkages, they can be on the, the drag braces or side stays or, or what's known as a torsion link, which are the, the scissors that keep the wheels pointing uh, in a certain direction. Uh, and typically there's multiples of these uh, for like weight on wheels. For instance, you would often have one on all three gear, left, right, and nose. Uh, and two of them would have to confirm the aircraft is on the ground, or two of them would have to show minimum that the aircraft was in the air before you could retract the landing gear, for instance. These are going to feed into our ability to see what the position is. So in older aircraft, these tended to be discrete lights, one or more for each gear. Uh, but they would have two or more filaments or two or more bulbs per light. That way, if a bulb burned out, they would still operate. Green would mean down and locked. Red light would mean not up and not down and locked. It's somewhere in between. Uh, but the light would turn off. They would typically go off if the gear was up and locked. And I put a question why if we were in class, I would ask. Um, but the lights shut off when the gear's up and locked as part of the dark flight deck concept. And that is when everything's normal for cruise flight, we don't want a bunch of lights lighting up, distracting the crew from uh, more important things. And so that's that looks something like this. So here are the the green is down and locked. Red means it's somewhere not up, not down and locked. It's somewhere in between. Uh, and then they would all shut off when the gear is up and locked. The other way, newer aircraft, this is going to be shown on ICAS. And you can see on this uh, ICAS display here, this is the primary page. It shows engine instrumentation as well as uh, basic fuel instrumentation, and there are three boxes here that show gear. And right now they're green and they say DN for down. Uh, when the gear's in transit, they'll go to a kind of a crosshatch pattern, um, or if they don't make it up to, if they end up somewhere between and they're, they're between too long, then they'll turn red. There's a timer function on it. Uh, or they, they can also do yellow depending on uh, there's multiple position sensors that feed in. And so uh, if, it, if it thinks it's down, but it doesn't have full confirmation, it can do a yellow. So there's all kinds of things that can be done on ICAS beyond just the straight green, red, or, or off. When the gear's up and locked on, a, on an ICAS display like this, those boxes just disappear. And so there would be nothing nothing there. Gear would have just a blank black area below it uh, that would indicate that the gear were all up. Uh, and then you also have messages. You can see here that there are messages that the nose door is open. Um, there's messages like a gear disagree. If you got some gear that are up, some gear that are down. Um, these are just example messages that would be shown in the in the warning area on this aircraft. Uh, there's the ability to open the nose doors with a switch on the ground. It's supposed to be flipped to the closed position before the plane is dispatched, but the, the ground crew has to open it for tow bar, hooking up tow bar and that kind of thing. 
Uh, and so then there's going to be a method of testing indication in both cases. So with the put with the lights, discrete lights, typically you're able to uh, push on them or press a test switch in order to verify that they'll all light up. And on an ICAST display, there's a test switch that's going to show your various messages and it might show other stuff in addition to gear. One of the requirements is that gear are able to be steered and in order to steer the gear, we need to uh, have a nose gear that can rotate or move. Uh, and that's typically done hydraulically. It can be controlled either mechanically uh, through through uh, cables and push pull cranks and stuff like that uh, or electrically, uh, which works similar to a fly by wire flight control system. In fact, the steering in general nose gear steering whether it's mechanical with hydraulic actuation is pretty much the same as uh, flight controls that are mechanically controlled and hydraulically operated uh, or electrically controlled and hydraulically operated. And that's, again, it's a fly by wire. It's going to have a feedback loop, just like, uh, just like our uh, flight controls. Uh, the one thing it has that um, it, that's unique to the nose gear that you're not going to have on your main gears is that it has to have some kind of a centering system shown here and that is so when the nose comes off the ground and that strut fully extends that upper cam lobe is going to integrate with the lower cam lobe and it's going to turn the gear straight ahead uh, because we don't want to ever have a plane landing with that nose gear turned away from straight ahead that's part of as the gear extends to its fully extended position will automatically do that. The main gear are going to carry the majority of the weight of the aircraft up to 90% or more. They're very, very close to the balance line. They're slightly behind uh, the center of gravity. We don't want the plane tipping back on its tail. Uh, but the uh, the it's, I say up to 90% or more, and in some cases, even upwards of 95%. The weight on the main gear is significantly higher than the nose. The nose carries a very small amount of the weight. And so those main gear are primarily going to be, they're the main support of the aircraft. Uh, but then that's where your brakes are going to be located for slowing and stopping. Uh, and in a fast stop situation, if they're, uh, if the crew needs to really stand on the brakes and use thrust reversion and all that, they'll still provide 80 to 90% of the stopping force. Uh, but in an emergency abort, if thrust reversers aren't available, they provide 100%, essentially 100% of the stopping force. So you got to take all that energy of that 50,000 pound, 100,000 pound, 500,000 pound, or in the case of like the a fully loaded A380 pushing a million pound airplane, that energy going several hundred miles an hour, not couple hundred miles an hour now it has to be dissipated and it's done so through those brakes and so uh, it's a pretty amazing system very has to deal with a lot of heat and a lot of energy there is a certain amount of steering that can be provided by the main landing gear with differential braking unlike your car with a single brake pedal uh, aircraft have two brake pedals one on each rudder pedal and so to turn the airplane left, you can tap or slightly apply the left brake. To turn the aircraft to the right, you can slightly apply the right. Uh, and braking can be done automatic or manual. So under normal taxi circumstances, it's typically manual. Uh, but for landing, these often have auto brake systems where crews can set it. And once the plane goes weight on wheels and senses that it's, it's on the ground and needs to slow, the brakes will be applied smoothly and automatically. And those systems often have the ability you can change it. So depending on the length of the runway and that kind of thing, the crew will uh, will set it uh, in order to brake within a certain distance. A lot of times these crews, they're, they, they're encouraged to use the brakes less harshly and, and rely more on things like thrust reversers uh, because that's less expensive to operate. They're cheaper to overhaul and that kind of thing. The gear then are transferring that weight into the ground. So they're designed to provide that weight distribution. And the way they do that is typically by having multiple tires. Uh, and so what you can see, the top row here of the left-hand image, the various tires, um, is it shows the contact patch in black. So the tires in red, and then above them, the contact area or load distribution areas in black. Uh, 
And you can see one large wheel, which would be difficult to handle, very heavy, everything else. You can see the size of that contact patch. If you compare it to a tandem or what, what are your most common, which would be a, a double gear or a bogey style with, with four or six wheels, is that those contact patches with two or four smaller wheels or even six smaller wheels are much, much bigger than a single large wheel. And so that's why it makes sense to have multiple smaller wheels rather than one giant tire uh, for an airplane. But the only time a giant tire makes sense is if you're landing on unimproved airstrips uh, things like rock and gravel and whatnot. Uh, but we have our various uh, component, our various layouts there. So small, smallest transport aircraft may have a single tire. Uh, tandem really isn't too common. There's some military aircraft that use more of a, a tandem type configuration. Uh, but the two, like I said, that you're going to see most common majority, probably the transport aircraft, medium size are going to have the Regional jets, small and medium sized transport aircraft are going to have the double gear configuration, letter C. And then your biggest aircraft, the, the 767, the 777, the A350, the A380, um, those are the, A, the 787. They're going to have a bogey style with either four or in the picture shown here from a seven, a 777, so Boeing 777, you can see it has six wheels on, on a given bogey. Those are connected to the aircraft through uh, struts that are used for shock absorption. And the biggest thing they're designed for is to dissipate that, that energy from landing, uh, and which can be three Gs or more of force, so three times the weight of the aircraft. The other part of that, that's the absorption part. The other part is they have to provide damping, which is when the aircraft lands, we don't want it bouncing back up in the air. And so they are, they have a way of absorbing the force and then a way of releasing that energy slowly uh, so that it doesn't bounce the airplane back in the air. Uh, but there's two kind of main configurations. So what you see here in the picture is something called a trailing link design where there's this, these two links with the, the strut kind of at an angle forming a triangular setup. Uh, and these are typically seen on some of the corporate aircraft, uh, the smaller regional jets, um, and then a straight oleo where the strut, strut goes basically straight up and down. Um, that's found on your medium and larger aircraft. The struts then can be broken down into two basic categories, and those have to deal with how the they have air inside of them, which provides the absorption side of it. It, it acts as a spring, it's a compressible air. Uh, or nitrogen is what we typically fill them with. And then what's and then oil and the oil is what provides the damping, the oil moving through various orifices, holes um, is what slows the reaction so that when the strut compresses, typically that oil is allowed to flow fairly easily during the compression stroke. Uh, but then it is restricted somewhat during the during the extension. Uh, and that slows down the extension so that it doesn't bounce the airplane. And the air and the oil, depending on whether which one's on top or on bottom, uh, the strut shown here in this image is what's called an air over oil. And so you have oil that just hydraulic fluid, and, and that's usually what it is. It's typically 5606 hydraulic fluid. Some do use SkyDraw hydraulic fluid is in the bottom of the strut and then the upper portion of it, but you don't fill the entire strut with fluid when it's extended. Uh, the upper portion is then filled with pressurized nitrogen. And so it's known as air over oil. And there's nothing actually dividing the air and the oil. It's just the air pushing on the surface of the fluid. The other style is an oil over air. And I have an example of that in this picture right here. And here you still have nitrogen uh, air, and this is in the bottom half of the strut now. And oil is in the top half of the strut, uh, and they're divided by a piston in the middle, and it's a, it's a sliding piston that's able to move up and down. So as the strut compresses, as the lower leg compresses, that air, that nitrogen, increases pressure, pushes on the oil, and moves it through a damping valve near the top of the strut. And then as the leg is allowed to extend, then that 
that nitrogen can can re-expand and fluid is able to flow back uh, the other direction through that damping valve. And so, uh, so number one here is when it's fully extended, air, airplanes in flight. And in image two, as the shock strut is compressed, the fluid is going to get is going through that damping valve. Uh, but the damping valve is designed to open and, and have minimal restriction to allow the shock to compress quickly on landing in, in image two. And then the rebound uh, as the struts compress, but it's going to start to rebound or extend a little bit shown in image three, where that fluid can is slowly pushed back up through the through the damping valve uh, by the by the nitrogen. So. Uh, these provide that. So if we put them side by side and look at two, we've got these here. And the the air over oil now one here does show something called the metering valve, and that's where it's essentially a big needle or a big tapered shaft through a hole. And so the more the strut is compressed, the the more it blocks the flow of fluid through the orifice uh, between the bottom and top half of between the strut leg and the upper portion of the strut. Gas pressures at the top to push on and extend it. And in the case of that, so this is the one on the right, uh, all the servicing is performed at the top. There's a combined filler plug and inflation valve at the top with our, our air over oil. On the left, the oil over air, you can see the, the piston in the middle dividing that. Gas pressures in the bottom, fluids at the top. There's another name for that, that orifice, uh, that damping valve is a clack valve. Uh, so I've got two different images here that show that. In this case, servicing nitrogen, uh, if you look at the, the image on the left, the, the fluid is serviced from the top of the strut, and there's a nitrogen valve, not labeled, uh, in the bottom of the valve. So, so our fluid is serviced through this main fitting up here. And then the nitrogen would be serviced through this little fitting down here that doesn't have a label on it compared to the air over oil where both fluid and nitrogen are serviced through a common valve here at the top. So when we're servicing it, you have to take that into account as part of it. So, um, we we would service it now there's two ways that these can be serviced uh, whether it's an air over oil or an oil over air strut um, in service we would often have to service the nitrogen only as long as there were no signs of fluid leakage the nitrogen over time a certain amount of it would escape and the strut would start to get low other times we would have to do a full service and sometimes this would mean uh, changing the oil because it gets dirty over time a certain amount of dust and dirt is able to work its way in through the seals uh, or if we've had to do a seal replacement because they were leaking, we would have to do a full service, get the, the oil serviced and the nitrogen. Uh, but in, in both cases, uh, the, it's important to um, kind of make sure you're paying attention to what it is and not, not over service it, not overdo the, the nitrogen, not overdo the oil, but but go with that. So if all we had to do is nitrogen, uh, the most accurate way to service it would be with the aircraft on jacks, which gives us a known extension. Um, and in that case, you would have to take into account temperature and the pressure that you're servicing it to and using a table and a chart to figure out where it should be, because as temperature rises, the pressure is going to rise. If the airplane's on ground, not only do you have to take temperature and pressure into into account, but you have to watch the you have to watch the extension of the strut as well. And so now you're balancing kind of three things, and it's a little bit tougher to get it to get it as accurate as possible. If you're doing a full service, and this is typically after a scheduled or a scheduled oil fluid change or a seal change or repair, um, the first step is it has to be done. Uh, with the nitrogen charge bled off of the strut. You have to collapse it all the way. And the, the normal process for most of these struts is you fill the oil with the strut fully collapsed, and then you service the nitrogen, and it can be done at that point on jacks or on the ground. And again, the most accurate way to do it is on jacks. Uh, but 
it can be done on the ground as well. Uh, it's just that you need to know that the nitrogen or the, the fluid has to be set with a strut collapsed and with all the pressure bled off. Uh, because of the weight of the aircraft can be different at different times, the exposed chrome on the strut, the strut extension is going to be dependent on the weight of the airplane as well as the pressure uh, of the nitrogen inside the strut. And so what we look at is something called dimension H. So that's shown here, the height of the strut, which is normally the chrome area of the lower leg. Uh, and it's typically red from the bottom of the chrome area to where the leg enters. And this is one of those uh, pressure, temperature, and dimension charts. And so you would have to look at what the strut, what the dimension H is, how extended is the strut, um, and what is the outside pressure, and or the outside temperature, excuse me, what is the temperature, and then you can use that to figure out what the pressure would be. Uh, but one of the things that happens is, is as you're servicing, when you have the servicing car hooked up and you start to add nitrogen pressure, it's often the case that the strut will begin to extend as well. And so then you have to kind of reconfigure, you have to find the new spot on this chart uh, where the H dimension, the, the height has changed in order to figure out what the new pressure should be at the given temperature. And so that's why it's easier if you have, a, if you have an airplane on jacks the struts fully extended, you have a known H dimension. In this case, it would be 6.7 inches. Uh, and then it's fairly easy. You can go straight up and down the line that's shown there. But uh, if if you don't, then you're you're again, you're watching the pressure on your servicing gauge. You're keeping, you're putting a, a ruler or a scale next to the strut chrome to figure out how high it is. And as you're servicing it, it could change a little bit. So it, it can be kind of a fun looking at three different variables while trying to uh, set the final pressure. The wheels and tires then are attached to axles that are at the bottom of the strut. And these are for these aircraft, uh, the tires that go on these are very, very heavy duty, very, very thick rubber. And so because of that, they can't really be stretched over the, over the wheels over the rims. Uh, and so they are two halves that are either bolted or lock ring together. And I've got kind of some schematic cutaways there. The top one shows two halves that are bolted together using something called tie bolts, just long bolts with nuts on the ends. Um, the lower part there shows what a lock ring looks like. And so in that case, the removable flange, the tires put onto the, the wheel casting, the removable flange is put on and actually pushed in further than it would normally sit. That lock ring snaps around the body of the wheel casting. So the the, the removable flange would, would slide onto the wheel casting just a little bit further in. And then this lock ring here would be placed into a groove along this edge right over here. And then the removable flange would be able to slide back towards and lock into that lock ring. Uh, and then as the tires inflated, that air pressure would hold that lock, that removal flange against and against the lock ring, also holding it in the, the slot that it locks into. On all of these tires, these are uh, pretty much every one of them on a transport aircraft is going to be a, a tubeless tire. So there's an inflation valve and stem that uh, bolts into or is part of the rim, part of the wheel casting. Uh, they're also going to have a thermal fuse in them somewhere. So if the brakes uh, get too hot or if the wheel gets too hot, if it the we don't want and the pressure increases in the tire, we don't want it to explode. And so there's a thermal fuse that will melt and, and essentially dump the air out of the tire uh, before it gets to a high enough pressure to burst. Um, there they have to be balanced, and there may be balance weights stuck on in various spots. And then in the center area, they're going to be there are going to be bearings with retainers that go between the wheel casting uh, or the wheel half and the axle so it can spin with minimal resistance. Inside the axle is an anti-skid transducer uh, and there's going to be a cap that connects the rim or the wheel casting to that so that the anti-skid transducer can measure how fast it's spinning and then finally the tire uh, that goes on the outside of this. 
The tires themselves are pretty hefty. They're very stout. And on the previous slide, there was a link for um, to kind of see some landings and just what kind of abuse these go through when they touch the ground. Um, but tubed, which you won't see too often, has an inner tube with a valve stem that holds air. They go inside the tire. Um, the tubes can be can be cord reinforced. The tires themselves are going to have multiple layers of cords in them, and they're typically for your smallest aircraft. And again, not seen on transport too often. Tubeless are what most of our transport category aircraft have, and the tire and the wheel seal together. So the the wheel itself is um, is sealed, and it becomes part of that pressure chamber. Various parts of a tire, this should be reviewed for most of you, but the crown is the area with the tread, the shoulders kind of on each side. Sidewall goes from the, goes up the sides of the tire and then the bead is where it locks into a rim. And inside that tire, we're gonna have multiple layers of plies that, uh, that, that hold the tire together, that provide strength. The rubber itself is not super strong. Um, but it is what it's the grippy material and the wear material. The plies that are inside of there provide the majority of the tensile strength. Uh, and plies can be run one of two directions bias ply, which is where they run from one sidewall up to the other at a, a typically about a 45 degree angle, although different manufacturers do all kinds of different things. So if you have a cord starting here, it kind of runs up over and goes down and back to the far side. For the back and then you'll have another set of plies that runs the opposite direction underneath it uh, that's what most of these tires are that's an extremely strong it's a very strong form of building a tire uh, the other style of tires are radial ply and that's where they kind of where you have uh, have plies or or cords is another name for them uh, going from side to side bead to bead straight over the top uh, and then a then a set of a set of plies or cords running radially around the tire this way. Uh, those aren't as strong. They tend to offer a plusher ride. So most cars nowadays use radio ply tires, uh, but they're not going to be as strong as a bias ply. So most of your bigger most tires on transport aircraft are going to be bias ply, uh, where they they're stiffer but more durable. Nose tires on aircraft often have a chine or deflector ring built into them. And this is an extra little bit of rubber molded uh, on the outside. And you can see, you have to be careful when these are installed, that they are installed with the deflector ring to the outside, this piece right here. Uh, and that is designed so when this tire goes through water, you know, it's going to push water up inboard, which this isn't really a big deal. It'll hit the belly of the airplane. Uh, but water going this direction, if it were to continue up, could be ingested into engines, either going over the wing on a, on a tail mounted engine or out towards the engines on the wing. So instead, what this, uh, what this ply, what this deflector ring does or chine tire does is any water that starts to be, be pushed up and out rather than flying back, it gets sent this direction. It bounces off of that off of that chine and, and pushed out to the side. Uh, and so by doing that, it, it helps prevent flame out on especially takeoff of your, uh, of your engines. When we're servicing these, we gotta pay attention to several different things. The first one is proper inflation and you can get different wear depending on how the tires have been. Uh, when we inflated tires, we had we had tire gauges, digital tire gauges that could go to a tenth of a psi, uh, and we would service them to within a tenth of a psi of their required pressure, and we would do that every three to five days. And so, proper inflation, you should have a good contact patch between the tread and the ground, and you should have nice even wear. If tires are overinflated, they're going to wear on the center. You're going to get uh, a lot of wear in the center of the uh, tread. And if they're underinflated, you'll get a lot of wear at the at the edges of the thread of the of the tread uh, because the center gets pushed up and there's no no air pressure helping to hold it against the ground. And when you when you look at a tire, you can see this, um, but we would 
Uh, again, we would check these every day. If we had a tire come in and it was 10% up to about 10% low, and these were typically serviced, our, our nose tires were like 130 PSI, mains could be on our smaller aircraft were 180 PSI, some of our bigger were up to 250 PSI. If they were 10% low or less, so, so 0 to 10% low, we could just service them. If they were 10 to 20% low, we would service them and we would put a watch on them where they would have to be checked again after 24 hours. Uh, if they were 20 to 30% low, we would have to change that tire. It could put enough stress on it that it would have to be changed. And if they were more than 30% low, we would have to change that tire as well as any other tires on that same landing gear. Uh, so if it was a, you know, a, a, if it was a twin, if you had two tires on an axle, or on the on a landing gear, you'd have to change both of them if either one of them was was thirty was more than thirty percent low. Because by having a tire that low, it's going to overstress its its body or overstress its partner on that landing gear. We would also look for, in addition to wear, we would have to look for other types of damage. So on the right here, I just talked about wear. Uh, the middle picture is kind of normal wear. Uh, this would be this tire oftentimes would still be serviceable right here. Uh, this tire on the right is starting to show cord, and the outermost layers of cord are, are indicating layers. They're not structural, so it's actually designed where when you see that, you know that the tire's worn out. Uh, newer tires, we often got chevroning, shown on the left, this area here. And actually, that is um, not, that was, that tire, a tire with this kind of chevroning on it, that's a spot where the tire, when the plane touched down, that's where the tire first touched the ground. As long as those weren't going through multiple sections of tread and didn't have chunks coming out with them, uh, that was actually considered serviceable. So, so that little bit of chevroning wasn't a big deal. It's where the where the rubber got smushed when that tire hit the ground. Below that is chemical damage, and typically where this occurred is if we had a leaking strut or there was hydraulic fluid on the ground. Um, it would soften the rubber and it would turn it into like a foamy rubber and some of it would get left behind. And so chemical damage like this was, uh, if it was at the, if you had a fairly new tire, it was fairly thick and there wasn't a lot of, it wasn't very deep, it actually could still be considered serviceable. Uh, but you often never knew exactly how deep that, that chemical damage was. And so we would typically change these tires uh, if they had this kind of chemical damage because you don't know how much that tire soaked up how high up into the rubber it was able to it was able to work its way up. A couple other things we would see sometimes flat spots. Uh, this is if a brake locked up, uh, whether it was on landing or even on taxi. Uh, there's a potential to flat spot on during taxiing, and you can see in this flat spot we've got the the indicator cords that I mentioned. You can see kind of around the outside here. There's some shown here. Um, but then you've got layers now of structural cords starting to show in the middle. And so that would have to be changed. And then on the right, you have sidewall bulging. If you see something like this, you want to get the get that tire, get it up on a jack, get pressure blood off of it right away because those do have the potential to burst. If they burst there, uh, it's not a good situation. So if you did have a bulging tire, you definitely wanted to remove that from service. Those sidewalls should never have... Uh, their strength or their any kind of uh, damage to them at all. And so that is definitely something that would be, uh, would need to be avoided or need to be dealt with. Another important part of our landing gear are the brakes. And these are uh, on these larger aircraft. Here is a, a diagram of one and an actual brake. They are multiple discs and the discs that are shown here key into the inside of the wheel rim. Uh, and so if we look at one of these, let me get my pen up, uh, this would be a key slot right here. And you would align these before you put the wheel on. And the inside of the wheel rim would have a um, kind of a bar or a, a key that would slide into that slot. And it would push against these, that would rotate these discs. So, so we've got, let me get rid of the existing annotations here. Um, so we have, in this case, you have one, two, three, and four discs. Okay, the brake behind it is a little bit bigger one. You can see that also has four discs that would rotate with the wheel. And then separating those discs on each side, 
there is the plates that apply pressure. And so these are the pressure is applied to the entire stack. So shown here on the front, this is our pressure plate right here, and it's pushed on by these actuators. And so you've got several, one, two, three, four, five, six hydraulic actuators that are pushing on that pressure plate all the way around. Um, and that's going to push this pressure plate against this disc. And then you have a, uh, you have what are called statters. These are plates in here that are keyed into the axle or into the center of this. Those are held stationary, but they are able to slide a little bit. So this whole stack can slide left to right. Uh, and then there's on the far side, this is all getting pushed against something called a backing plate. Uh, and that is on the essentially the far end or an end plate uh, on the far end. And so the pressure plate pushes against the rotors and statters, uh, forcing them together, and that puts the end. And so uh, these are can be hydraulically actuated. This is a hydraulically actuated brake. Some airplanes now are going to electrically actuated brakes. Um, they're self-adjusting over time. These just this whole stack up gets shorter, and these these uh, actuators can push further over, uh, and so they they are self-adjust. They don't have to be adjusted over time. Um, there and there are, but there are wear indicators that would um, that would be present in order to know how worn it is. This brake doesn't have it, but it would be a pin that attaches here, goes through this little circular hole. Uh, it's also shown right here. And as that brake, as all this stuff in here wears down, this pressure plate's going to move further to the left. And so that pin will be closer and closer to its little bracket. Or right here, it'll be closer and closer to this little bracket as this wears down and moves to the right. Uh, and that once that pin becomes essentially flush with that bracket, that's what tells you that your brake is worn out. In these brakes as well, we want to monitor temperature, and so there's uh, there's a thermocouple probe that kind of goes down into the middle of the brake, uh, and that uh, will provide temperature. And then um, again, if they're hydraulic, some can be self bleeding, although most of them are going to require bleeding after they've been changed. And that's where at the top uh, there's a little screw, and right here is the bleeder valve on this one. This one has a bleeder valve kind of integral to this hookup point. Uh, and so fluid is, in order to bleed these, the brakes are applied. The hydraulic system has to be on. The pressure for these comes from the aircraft hydraulic system, not from a master cylinder. Uh, and essentially pressing the brakes just ports hydraulic system pressure to the brake. And then that, that bleeder screw at the top is cracked open. Uh, to allow air bubbles out. One thing you have to be careful of, oftentimes the lines going to these, when we talked about hydraulics, they have a hydraulic fuse. And so if you open that bleeder screw too quickly, uh, that will activate the hydraulic fuse. Uh, so you have to either hold that hydraulic fuse in the uh, deactivated position, uh, or you have to be very careful to go very slow so that you don't get too much fluid flow and kick off that. These are independently controlled on a left to right basis. They're controlled by the, the brake pedals, and there's a, a left pedal and a right pedal on the two rudders. Uh, they can also be, each brake can be individually controlled by an anti-skid system. Uh, so if that senses, there's a wheel speed transducer in each one of these. We'll look at that in the next page. And if that senses a single brake locked up, it'll, it will, uh, it will stop or it will cut off the, the pressure going to that specific brake to allow that wheel to start spinning again. Uh, they can also be done automatically. I talked earlier about uh, auto brake systems. So when the plane lands, the auto brake system can kick in and apply these automatically and evenly. And then finally, they, uh, they also serve as the parking brake. So a certain amount of pressure is applied to them and held there, uh, oftentimes using a hydraulic accumulator uh, that can hold these applied when the uh, when the plane is not being used or when the parking brake is set. Uh, as long as the hydraulic system is on on the airplane, the hydraulic the parking brakes typically work pretty well. Uh, if the hydraulic systems are not on, they often do have a accumulator that can hold pressure for a certain amount of time, but it typically will not last forever. It bleeds off, and in a lot of cases, that's roughly about two hours. Uh, and so that's why it's important to chalk the plane because the parking brakes are notoriously unreliable.
The last item here is the wheel speed sensor, which is part of the anti-skid system. And so this lives inside of the axle. There's a little wheel speed transducer uh, and it's show, shown in this image. And what this does is it, it's in here and it's got a, the end of it can be spun. It's got a little speed sense, a little thing on there that has a drive coupling. So this drive coupling can spin the shaft that comes out the end of the transducer and the transducer lives inside the axle. That drive coupling keys into uh, a clip on the inside of the hubcap. So the hubcap screws into the wheel, uh, the hubcap assembly and, and all that. Oops, sorry, I'm too far over. Here's the, here's the little clip right here. Uh, that's screwed into the wheel. This shows a hubcap cover. Uh, that's screwed into the wheel. So this this hubcap here, this anti there, this anti skid wheel speed transducer hubcap um, is able to spin with the wheel, and that spins the drive coupling, which spins the shaft and spins the transducer. So it can send a signal to the wheel speed or the anti skid computer, telling it how fast the wheel's spinning, and it compares those wheel to wheel. And if one of them is slow or stopped, the, that anti-skid computer will release pressure or, or reduce the pressure on that one brake to get the wheel spinning again. Uh, the, again, they're independently controlled. It can be done for each wheel. Um, they oftentimes are not active at low taxi speeds. They're really designed as something of a, at a higher speed item. So they don't typically work at low speeds. Uh, and any modern aircraft, these are electrical. There were a few airplanes back in the day where they used a hydromechanical transducer uh, with flyweights and that kind of thing. And those were those were interesting systems, but you don't see them anymore. There's kind of an interesting video here. It shows when the 747-8 was being certified, they have to do what's called a rejected takeoff test where they, they get up to full takeoff speed, fully loaded and then have to stop the airplane using only the brakes and you watch what happens when the brakes get really hot and burst the uh, burst the the temp plugs the high temp plugs and so you know, if you want to watch that that's there but that uh, wraps up landing gear for transport category aircraft